So here we are, First and Second Peter, a message for today's church from Peter the Apostle. This is lesson number seven in this particular series. The title of this lesson this morning is Beware the False Teachers. And uh, our text is Second Peter chapter, uh, chapter one. Uh, so we're studying uh, First and Second Peter, as we said at the very beginning. Uh, this is essentially Peter's last sermon uh, to the church, last letter that he writes that we know of uh, before his death. And uh, so far we've said that uh, he makes uh, several key exhortations about the Christian life. That's what this second epistle uh, is about. In the last lesson we studied the first of these uh, exhortations and that was you have to grow or you're going to die. In other words, you have to grow spiritually, you have to continue growing spiritually or else you will begin to die spiritually. You can't just kind of stay still. It's a, it's a fluid thing. Spiritual growth is a, a fluid thing. You have to continue to evolve. And that was the main uh, exhortation that he makes at the beginning of the second, uh, the second epistle. Uh, he also explains that what fuels this growth, the spiritual growth, is the ongoing knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, which has been made possible uh, by the revelation of God's word and His only begotten Son. So the point he makes at the beginning is, uh, in order to grow, uh, the process of grow, uh, growth involves you knowing more and more uh, who God is and who Jesus is. And the good news for you is that God has fully revealed Himself, so you can really know Him. There's no end uh, to that uh, process. And then, of course, he details how this knowledge of God is acquired on a daily basis. The, the kind of nuts and bolts of how a person gets to know God and thus continue in this spiritual growth and development. Uh, Peter says that uh, beginning with one's faith, which initially saves us, we are to add to this initial faith um, moral excellence and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. You know, talked about all of these uh, virtues uh, last week. And in the process of gaining these things, we come into a greater and greater knowledge of God. Then he concludes uh, that uh, the person who is practicing these things is going to grow in his uh, knowledge of God, grow also in his confidence of salvation, grow in his appreciation and experience of the heavenly kingdom where he will eventually dwell forever. The idea is as you get to know God practicing these things, you also get a taste of heaven. And so it's like you get a taste of what heaven is like before you actually, before you actually go there. And that's the motivation that, that keeps you in this process. Okay, so Peter, after having said this, he turns from the future, he's talking about the future, planning for the future, growing for the future, so on and so forth. He, he switches here and he goes from talking about the future to talking about the present. What's going on now? Two things that concern uh, the church in the here and now. So the process that he has so eloquently spoken of that leads to heaven begins with faith. And as Paul explains in Romans 10, 17, faith, this initial faith, how do you get this initial faith? Well, Paul says, faith comes from hearing and hearing the words of Christ, Romans 10, 17. So the word, God's word, this is the source of faith. And so Peter wants to reassure them that this basis for their spiritual growth, this faith, this word, it's solid. You can, you can have confidence in it. And so that uh, we find ourselves now in 1 Peter um, uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. And that's where we are today. That's where we're going to pick it up. So let's read verse 12 to 14. He says, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present in you. I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. So he, he, he confirms that there are uh, not these things that he said to them, you know, add to your faith, uh, moral excellence, so on and so forth. He confirms with them that these things, they're not new ideas. They're ones that they have been taught and known through the gospel, which he calls the truth. 
They're things which they've known through the gospel, which is what began the process in them in the first place. So Peter finds it necessary to remind them one last time because the Lord has revealed to him that he is about to die. So you know, I'm writing this letter and I'm reminding you of these things because I know that I don't have a lot of time left. All right? So we go on, verse 15, he says, and I will be also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Verse 17, he says, For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to Him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with Him on the holy mountain. So this letter, he says, will serve as a constant reminder after he is gone. So now he tells them why his letter, along with the other apostolic writings and scriptures that they already have, should be considered inspired and, and should be considered as authoritative for them as they develop in spiritual growth. It gives them two reasons. One, he says, listen, we, we, didn't, we didn't create the gospel. We didn't make this stuff up. These are not fables. These are not myths that we're talking to you about. He says, we were eyewitnesses of Jesus' you know, his baptism, his ministry, his teaching, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. So he's saying to them, their preaching was not made of fables and stories, but a, an eyewitness account of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you can have, you can have confidence that what we're writing to you, not mysteries or anything, we, we saw, we're talking about what we saw, what we experienced. So you can have confidence in the word upon which your faith is based. You see the construction there? And then he says, in addition to this, they also were witnesses to his relationship to the Father in heaven, having both seen the glory of heaven, right? And Peter, James, John went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Jesus transformed into His glorified body. He said, we, we saw that. And not only, he says, not only did we see Him glorified, we heard the voice of the Father speaking to the Son. So you know, we're not just making stuff up. We're, we're talking about not only witnessing miracles and things, we witnessed the actual glorification of Jesus. And we heard God Himself you know, uh, confirming that this was His Son. And so he goes on in verse 19 and says, So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. So the apostles not only have the words of the prophets describing the coming of the Messiah and what He was going to do, you know, like he says, so we, we have the prophetic word made more sure. We, we don't just have that. We also have witnessed the coming and the fulfillment of all the prophecies about him. You know, all the prophets had was, you know, all the people had before was the word of the prophets that something was going to happen. But we, we have the word of the prophets that something was going to happen and we are witnesses that all these prophecies were fulfilled. Therefore, the brethren would do well to pay attention to the things written by them, meaning not the prophets, but the things written by Peter and the other apostles uh, as they are giving them instructions concerning their spiritual development. So th this is all about spiritual development. You know, add to your faith, moral excellence, all these other things. Keep doing that if you want to grow spiritually. And don't worry, what we're telling you, this is solid stuff. This is solid stuff based on God's word, based on the eyewitness, based on the fact that we saw and heard what we saw and heard. Verse 20, he goes on. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So the prophets, he goes on to say, they didn't speak from themselves but they were inspired as to what they would say by the Holy Spirit. So the word inspired, of course, means God breathed or to God breathing. And so the image that he paints here is like a sailboat 
a sailboat moved along by the wind. There can be a lot of different types of sailboats, but the one thing that they have in common is that it is the wind that moves them about. So in the same way, he's saying different men, different times wrote the Bible, but the one thing in common was that each of them was moved by the Holy Spirit to write what he wrote. So the point Peter is making here is that even though he and the other apostles witnessed the life and the teachings of Jesus, it was by the power of the Holy Spirit that they and he, Peter, wrote to the churches. So he doesn't even you know, depend on his own intelligence or his own mind about what he's writing. He says, yeah, we, we, saw the, we saw the resurrection and we saw Jesus transform. We saw all these things, but you know what? The things that we're writing, these things are inspired, are, are breathed by the Spirit of God, not, not we ourselves. So the point that he's making is that the readers can have confidence, even after Peter is gone, they can have confidence to be reminded by his words because these are not just his words, they are the guidance of the Holy Spirit from God. So have confidence in what I'm writing you. Even after I'm gone, have confidence in what I've written you because what I've written you comes from, comes from God. Essentially, here Peter is claiming that his writings are inspired. And you know, if somebody says, what does it say in the Bible that it's inspired? You know, well, this, this is a good proof text right here. Peter is claiming his own writings are inspired by God. Okay, so that's the first thing, that he, you know, that first exhortation that he gives them, reminder. All right? The second thing he reminds them about in the present is that they need to be careful uh, for uh, false teachers. Since the word is the source of their faith and the foundation for their growth and entry into the kingdom of heaven, it will become a special target for Satan to destroy. And one of his attacks will be to send false teachers into the church. So he's warning them, you know, after I'm gone, you need, to be, you need to hang on to the word because it's inspired, and you need to be careful because there will be some that will come into the church to try to teach things which are incorrect, which are false. So let's read 2 Peter chapter 2 now, that's where he, you know, the new idea comes in. He says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you. So you see, he's, he's pivoting here and he's saying, yeah, the word is solid, what I'm writing to you, this is inspired, but, he says, be careful. Just like in the past where they had false teachers, false prophets, Today, in our day, he says, false teachers, false prophets will also try to infiltrate the church. That's the warning, okay? And he says, uh, among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who, who, who bought them, bringing swift destruction um, upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So he, he goes back to the past. You know, Israel, they had false prophets who tried to lure the people back into idolatry or merely served evil kings you know, for favor. Well, in the same way, he says, lying teachers will come into the church to introduce false doctrines even denying that Jesus Christ is God. You know, there's a, uh, you know, I, we could do a lot of different uh, examples here, but I pick one called the Jesus Seminar. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Jesus Seminar. Every year or every couple of years, a group of theologians, renowned theologians and thinkers and philosophers, come together. It's, like, it's a seminar and they discuss various issues of the Bible and religion, so on and so forth, and that meeting is called the Jesus Seminar. Well, the thing that's unusual and ironic about the Jesus Seminar is when this group of thinkers is through and they put, put out their paper, their results, usually it's to deny uh, that Jesus is the Son of God or it's to deny that miracles actually happened or it's to under, under, uh, you know, undercut you know, one of the books of the Bible. In other words, the name is false. You know, it's, the, uh, it's the denying Jesus seminar. 
and yet this seminar gets a lot of press. You know, when they put out their, not their encyclical, but when they put out their, their, their results, it's covered by newspapers and editorialists and so on and so forth. And so this is exactly what Peter is talking about. Teachers, PhDs, supposedly very smart men and women, come into the church you know, under the banner of Jesus Seminar, and what do they do? Well, they try to deconstruct the faith. <laughs> they try to tear apart the inspiration of the scripture, all under the banner of academics, all under the banner of, well, we're, we're smart people. <laughs> we're well-educated people. You ought to listen to us. Nothing has changed. The same kind of people went into the church in the first century under the guise of what? Well, we're smart people. We're philosophers. We know what we're talking about. Listen to us. This is what Peter is warning against. So Peter says that the penalty now, as it was in Israel for false prophets, will be swift destruction. So they, the false teachers, he says, may be on earth for a while, but when judgment comes, their destruction will be sudden and it'll be final. Now unfortunately, many will be taken in by false teaching and led into disbelief and the life of sinfulness that disbelief breathes. You know, sinfulness doesn't just start in a vacuum for a believer. For a believer, continual sinfulness, a life of sin, begins with the decrease of their faith, as well as manipulation and swindling that often accompanies false religious teachers. I don't want to go into the headlines, but you know, how many times have we seen that? Some famous, you know, religious evangelist or something like that, uh, you know, big TV show, big this, big that, and then all of a sudden they find some scandal, usually involving money or sex, something like that, brings that person down and unfortunately destroys the faith of so many that that person kind of brought with him. So Peter says that their success does not cancel or mask the certain judgment that's awaiting them. Don't be fooled just because the world applauds and just because it's a huge thing and it's on TV or whatever, doesn't make it so, doesn't make it true, doesn't make it accurate. The way to decide is always against this. Doesn't matter that that person's talking to a million people. Never mind that, never mind the audience. Listen to what they're saying and, and compare it to what it says here. If it matches, hallelujah, great. We've got a, a believer preaching the truth to a million people. We want that. But if it doesn't match this, no amount of slick you know, commercialization is going to make it right. So let's keep reading. Verse four, he says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. So he stops, you know, he makes a parenthetical statement. You know, he's saying God is going to judge these false teachers and then he says, and speaking of judgment, okay, speaking of judgment, he mentions those who were judged in the past as a reminder to those who thought that judgment for these people was slow or wasn't coming at all. And he mentions several judgments that took place in the past. The angels, for example, they were judged and punished for leaving their position and aspiring to be greater than God or, for not, or, or, or not obeying Him or not remaining in their position. They were judged. And the ancient world, it was wiped out by a flood for its wickedness. They were judged. And Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for their sins as well. They were judged. So his point here is, if they doubt judgment and punishment that is going to come in the future, they should look at the past and see what God did to the wicked at that time and the punishment that they received. And let that be a lesson for the future. Let that stand as a witness for everyone, everyone who says, where's the judgment? Nothing's going to happen. Look at this, we're going on and on. Nobody, nobody's hurt, nothing's happening. Peter says, yeah, well, take a look at what happened in the past. If God is not afraid to judge angels, an entire civilization, 
city, if he's, if he's not worried about judging those people, don't worry, he's not worried about judging the people in the future as well. Pay attention, he said, pay attention. Verse seven, keeps going. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented after day, uh, day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. So on one hand, he says, speaking of judgment, and he says, God knows how to judge, and he gives a couple of examples of his judgment in the past, and now he says, and God also knows how to save. You know, he knows how to judge the wicked, but he also knows how to save the righteous. So he deals with both the obedient and the disobedience excuse me, in times of evil and temptation. So, and he gives two examples. Lot, right, Abraham's nephew. Lot was surrounded by evil, but with God's help he was able to resist the pressure and he was saved from the destruction that eventually came to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the others who disobeyed, they were destroyed, but the righteous are saved. So you know, he's saying God knows how to judge and God knows how to save. He knows how to do both things. The point for the readers is that even though they may have to face false teachers and various trials of persecution for their faith, the same God who has the power to punish the evil also has the power to sustain them, the good, the obedience, through trials. This is a passage that I show people who say, you know what, you know, why should we bring children into this evil world? Have you ever heard somebody say that? Young people say, well, I don't know if we should even have kids. You know, this evil world, you know, I don't know. This is pretty bad. You know? Of course, if you're saying that today, you're saying that because you didn't live through World War I or World War II. <laughs> it was pretty bad then too. But I show them this passage and tell them, you know what? The same God who will punish those evil people in those wars and those, those, those you know, dictators, the same God is going to do that. He knows how to preserve the righteous as well in times of in times of evil. You know, don't lack faith, just trust in God. Of course, uh, getting back to our passage, of course he has already mentioned the way to be sustained in trial, right? At the very beginning. How, do, how are we Christians sustained in times of difficulty? Well, we diligently add to faith moral excellence, we add to moral excellence knowledge. You know, we keep doing what we're doing. We keep practicing the spiritual disciplines that develop our knowledge of God. That's what we do in times of trouble. I've said this to you before. Whoa, what would happen if you know, uh, the communists took over the United States of America or the Islamists, you know, they won the war and you know, they set up uh, Islamic State in the USA. Well, what would you do? Well, pretty much the same thing I'm doing now except I couldn't do it openly, we'd have to meet in somebody's house secretly, but you know, I'd say open your Bibles to 2 Peter. <laughs> Any questions? We'd be secretly filming, we'd be underground, we'd be, you know, instead of advertising our stuff openly, it'd be underground, it would be secret. I got a letter from, uh, I got an email from a woman in China who said, thank you so much. She said, I've just been baptized secretly and I had no resources, and I purchased a link to get onto the internet so I could go to see YouTube videos, and I found Bible talk on YouTube, and I found Christianity for Beginners, all seven videos, and I've listened to them, and now I'm sharing them with my friends. She's not openly sharing them, she's sharing them secretly with her friends. So how, how is she living her Christian life in a totalitarian regime, in an atheistic, communistic society? How is she surviving as a Christian? Well, by the power of God, through faith, using the resources that little Choctaw, Church of Christ in Choctaw America is providing her. And we would do the same if we were in her situation. Why? Because God knows how to keep the saved saved, and he knows how to punish the unfaithful as well. So now Peter, in, beginning in verse 10, 
he finishes this chapter with a long description of the character and the actions and the attitude of the false teachers that have always and will continue to plague God's church until Jesus returns. So he goes on now, uh, you know, in modern English, he goes on a tear here. He goes on a tear, a diatribe, okay? We start in verse 10. He says, and especially those, he's saying, God will judge, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority, daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. So he says these people, these false teachers and what they breathe, they're sensual, they're carnal in nature, they're worldly, and they hate authority, human authority or scriptural authority. They revile or they blaspheme spiritual things without fear, without shame. They teach falsely or they ridicule spiritual things without regard, he says. Peter says that angels who could destroy these people in an instant do not even enter a word against them. In other words, the angels don't even say anything to these false teachers. Why? Because the angels realize that the judgment belongs to the Lord. Even though these false teachers are reviling the angels, the angels do not say anything back. They're waiting for God to judge. Great example there for us. He keeps going, verse 12, he says, but these like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. So they're like animals, he said, who savage and destroy on instinct, but they're doomed to be destroyed like the rabbit animals that they are. Wow, strong language here. Keeps going. He says, they are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. So these people, he's saying, they're not confused. This isn't like a legitimate mistake. They're, they're like mistaken about what they believe or what they think. They're not like that. He says they know exactly what they're doing and they're enjoying doing it. They enjoy their sensual sins. They enjoy reducing unstable, meaning ungrowing. Remember I said grow or die? They enjoy picking off the weak of the litter, if you wish. So they enjoy seducing unstable Christians and luring them into similar sins of greed and sexual immorality. So he compares them to scabs and stains on the fellowship of true believers. And he says that their motivation is sin and they have no conscience about destroying a, a, a person's faith and an entire congregation if they have to. These are pretty bad people, 15 and 16. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. So he compares these false teachers to a prophet in the Old Testament who also was enticed by money to curse God's people but he was stopped by an angel and the miraculous, even his own animal spoke to him. You know, he was trying to go a certain way and the animal wouldn't go because the animal saw that there was an angel there and finally he starts beating on this animal, this mule, you know, and the mule speaks and says, why, why are you beating on me? You know, haven't I served you well? <laughs> I mean, imagine being rebuked by an animal. That's, that's, that's pretty bad, that's pretty bad. His greed, this fellow here, Balaam, his greed eventually overcame him on another occasion and he died a miserable death for having perverted the gift. He was really a prophet, but he used his gift, in a, in an incre he used his gift for money. He was selling his gift, if, if, if this is what Peter is referring to. So a lot of these teachers, preachers, many of them you know, have a gift. God's given them a, 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 an ability but they, they're using that ability for the, wrong, for the wrong reasons. Verse 17, he says, these are springs without water and mists 
driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. So here he pronounces the final end of all such false prophets, past, present, and future. The blackness, the darkness. Verse 18 and 19 continues, he says, for speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. So Peter explains what some of the false teachers were actually doing at the time of his writing. They were telling new converts, these are the ones who had barely escaped, right? They, they just barely escaped destruction, new converts. They were telling these people that they could be good Christians, but still enjoy their sinful pleasures as well. In other words, you could have it all. And the result, of course, was that those without knowledge and those without self-control would go back to the things that they were slaves to before being rescued by Christ. So they were doing with, this they were doing rather with fancy preaching and high words that served as an intelligent discourse. You know, hey, we're smart, we're educated, trust us, what we're telling you. Now some people who study this, some scholars think that what these false teachers were promoting was a, the Greek idea of dualism. And in the Greek idea, philosophic idea of dualism is that whatever is done in the flesh has no effect in the spirit. And whatever is done in the spirit has no effect on the flesh. That's why they call it dualism. They're two spheres and they don't intersect. And they were trying to marry this Greek idea with Christianity. Okay? And so what you do in one doesn't affect what happens in the other. But if you buy into this, you can have it both ways. You can sin without guilt in your spirit, because you can sin in your flesh and not feel guilty in your spirit. Why? Well, because they're teaching. Whatever you do in the flesh doesn't affect the spirit. And you could, you could worship God in the spirit without changing anything in the flesh. Why? Well, because whatever you do in the spirit doesn't affect the flesh. Of course, this is false freedom, isn't it? Peter says, because sin does not set you free. Sin imprisons you to itself. That's a reality. Ask those people who are imprisoned by whatever, pornography or violence or greed or drugs, well, you know, ask the people who are imprisoned by those things how free they feel. So in verse 20, he says, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by knowledge of the Lord and Savior, these are the new Christians, if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. So here Peter rebukes not only the false teachers, but the, four, the poor victims who are taken in by their hypocrisy and their doctrines. And he says two things, three things rather, to them. First, he says, if they go back to the world after having known Jesus and salvation, their second enslavement to sin will be worse than their first. A little example, you know, uh, those of you who ever smoked before, I remember you know, uh, when I used to smoke, smoked a lot, really liked to smoke, was my favorite thing. And, and then I would quit. You know, I would, okay, no more, throw cigarettes in the garbage, no more. You know, and I'd quit and I'd be, I'd be good, three months. You know, and then you know, I was at a party or something, just before I became a Christian. I was at a party or something, you know how it is, at a party, you know. How, how, can you, how can you not smoke when you have a beer? You know, they go together, you, know, you, can't, you can't, it's wrong, it's wrong. That's it, it's wrong. Beer, no cigarette, it's just wrong. <laughs> so I'd say, yeah, just one for tonight. Oh dear, that was such a mistake. Because you know, those of you who have smoked, oh, if you quit and then go back, oh man, I used to smoke half a pack, now I'm smoking a pack a day, a pack and a half a day. You know? Well, the same idea, that's what he's saying. Boy, you, if you've been saved, then go back to the world, oh man, it'll be worse than, 
before. And this time their suffering, he says, will be accompanied by the awful realization that they had escaped this, one, this thing before and they put themselves right back in the same position. That's how I felt. I say, man, what was I thinking? I had this thing beat three months. Now I got to start all over again. Well, he's saying those who go back to the life of sin, you know, you're going to say to yourself, what was I thinking? I was saved. I was on my way. Second thing he says, it would be better for them to remain in ignorance because judgment is worse for those who know better, but they don't do it. And thirdly, he says, those who do this, they're not worthy of Christ, acting more like dumb animals than spiritual people. Pretty harsh, <laughs> pretty harsh. So in his warning, Peter points to the false teachers and he reveals that they will be punished along with those who allow themselves to be seduced by them. So let's kind of summarize this, shall we? Because we only got about two, three minutes left. These admonitions were written 2,000 years ago. But as Peter says, these admonitions were meant to be relevant to us today because the words are the inspired words of God. Peter said, my words, they come from God. So from these we can draw a couple of warnings that would do us well today, today, today. So warning number one, stick to the word. Every heresy, every division, every apostasy always begins with the disrespect, the disobedience or disbelief of God's inspired word. So long as the Bible in its entirety remains the sole authority and guide, we will always have a lamp to guide our feet through this dark world. Now we don't always agree about what it says, that's true. We don't always agree on how to apply things, that's normal, we're human beings. But we must always agree that it is God's word and our search always begins here and always ends here. Number two, beware false teachers. They come in all shapes and sizes. Some are obvious who use religion as a cloak to gain political favor, social power, wealth, prestige. Some are like moles you know, who spread their false ideals one person at a time in the congregation, in the church. One of the primary tasks of elders you know, in Acts chapter 20 is to monitor and guard against false teaching and teachers in the church. You ever notice all the classes we have here? There's always an elder or two sitting in that class. You think that's by accident? They're doing their job, they're listening, they're observing. The Bible even tells us what to do with false teachers, right? Paul says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech they will deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So watch or identify those who are uh, uh, teaching false things and warn them and turn away or disfellowship them if they don't repent. Be careful, false teachers um, is not just somebody, uh, yeah, I have to make a caveat here since we're talking about, false teacher, a false teacher is not just somebody who disagrees with you. <laughs> you think it's okay to clap hands while we're singing you know, Jesus loves me or something and another person says no I don't think we ought to do that. That difference of opinion doesn't make one guy a false teacher. Okay? We may not agree uh, one cup, some churches do one cup, some churches we do lots of cups. You know? That doesn't make the person who takes one cup, that doesn't make them a false teacher. We have a difference of opinion. And I'm sorry we're running out of time here. I'd like to say a little bit longer. Just let me tell you just this very quickly. There are only two things that you can, if you read through the New Testament, two matters where someone was declared a false teacher because of teaching this. One is, who is the person of Jesus? Okay, so a heresy, a legitimate heresy involves who Jesus is. So if Somebody starts, if I get up here and I say, you know what I've been thinking, I don't think Jesus is really divine. I think He was just a man and He was just a prophet. Whoops, that's heresy. That's, okay, that's. And the other one is, how are we saved? That's the other you know, key of heresy, target of heresy. We're not saved by works or good deeds. We're not just saved because we think, you know, uh, we believe. And so in the Bible, people who miss 
taught or taught falsely concerning who Jesus is or how we are to be saved, they were declared heretics. But if one person believed, I don't know, we, we, we ought to take communion every day and someone else, someone else said, no, we ought, to, you know, we, we ought to take communion just on Sunday or we ought to take communion once a month. Is there error there? Yes. We need to be patient to teach, to arrive at the proper thing that the Bible teaches. But I'm just saying, we need to be careful who we call a heretic. Okay? In the Bible, he says that uh, the false teachers that Peter is talking about, you can tell them and who they are because they have a lifestyle that is contrary to the teachings of Christ. And they make an attempt to draw people away from holy living. And they teach and their actions create strife in the, in the church. So again, we mustn't be afraid to admonish people and to warn people if they're teaching incorrectly or if they're teaching falsely. All right, and then one other thing here I need to put, the method, uh, yes, sorry, there we go, there we go. Stick to the word, beware of false teachers, be careful, pay attention, and the third one, recognize that God will punish the evil and the disbeliever, and the warning here is what Peter says. The sad thing is, God will punish the false teachers, <clears throat> but unfortunately, He'll also punish the victims. Doesn't seem fair, does it? But that's what he says here. Since we have an overwhelming amount of information to keep us on the right road, Peter is saying stick with this and be careful of false teachers because they will be punished and those that they draw after them will also be punished. So pay attention at all times. All right, well we're going to have to stop here. We'll pick up 2 Peter uh, next week. All right, thank you very much.